Hey guys, this is Hunter Levine, and thank you for listening to the Captain's Collective Podcast, brought to you by Skinny Water Culture, Hell's Bay Boat Works, and Orvis Fly Fishing. To learn more about our sponsors and why we partner with them, head to captainscollective.com. In today's episode, we sit down with Dave Bradley of Australian Fly Fishing Outfitters and discuss how he encountered fly fishing in Australia, which eventually led him to frequent trips to Florida, where he got a chance to learn from some legendary anglers. We also discuss chasing permit and giant trevally, remote mothership trips, and hear about his love for motorbikes and tattoos. Dave and I met when he came over for Harry Spears' 70th birthday party. Harry even joins us in the not-so-rapid-fire question section, and we have a lot of fun learning from Dave and hearing stories from his fishery. We hope that you enjoy. This is the Captain's Collective. I don't say it's anything you choose. I think it picks you. You know, it's genetic. And Hank said, you won. I grabbed my dad by his face and kissed him on the mouth. And you, I couldn't have smiled harder. My lips were past my ears. If you have a fly rod in your hand, it's this tool that takes you to beautiful places. You meet hopefully wonderful people. And it's just this cherry on top of this outdoor adventure. When the fish is coming, that shot within a shot, that timer starts. Beep, 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 well, hey, Dave, thanks for hanging out with us and joining us on the podcast. And you came over here to the States for Harry Spears' 100th birthday party? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I believe it's maybe 70 or 70. That's close. No, yeah. no. Um, could you just tell us how you got into guiding and even maybe before that, how you got into fishing in the outdoors? Uh, yeah, I guess I, I grew up in a small town. It's up, it's up in northeast Queensland. It's kind of a rainforesty area, so there's a lot of small freshwater creeks which you got you know very small freshwater fish in them i suppose so little spin rods and little little plugs lures we call them but um and i guess i didn't really fish that much when i was a kid though because there's lots of other you know kid things to do um and then i i suppose late uh teenager late teens started fishing with a couple other friends and out of boats and catching barramundi on the same type of gear you know maybe uh bait casters and whatever and and that quickly uh became a pretty you know avid pastime so that moved to well i think the a guy that's a good mate of mine now owns the tackle, local tackle shop and i think he was he, probably the only guy who fly fished so he convinced me to grab a buy a fly rod <laughs> off him and so he'd have someone to fish with i think <laughs> was the story uh so that evolved, I guess, over the next, it was probably about seven or eight, maybe close to 10 years. And then the guiding thing was uh, probably a shortage of guides and almost invited to be, you know, um, other guys that were busy and, mm -hmm. yeah, kind of so. asked me to set it up so I could help them out, really. That was probably the start. Okay. How, how old were you when they first asked you to start guiding? Oh, late 20s. Okay, yeah. and and was it fly guiding or was it? Uh, yeah, they mostly were probably conventional tackle, but they did a, a reasonable mm -hmm. amount of both. Um, and yeah, I think probably the fact that I wanted to fly fish that's why my guiding headed that way anyway. Mm -hmm. So yeah, for those who maybe aren't super familiar with. Australia and y'all's fishery. Could you just describe it a little bit for us to kind of give us a rundown? Yeah, where I I guess where I fish the most is a, a place called the Hinchinbrook Channel. It's inside um, an island, a really mountainous island, pretty place. It's uh, it's probably about thirty odd miles long. So there's a mangrove system, you know, thirty miles long by you know, five miles wide, I suppose, and full of 
creeks coming in either side and that it's just maybe a smaller version of the ever the mangroves in the mm. Everglade area. But similar similar, yeah, in that regard. Yep. Um and that's full of species, I suppose, for um our targets would be barramundi and permit. But there's, you know, queenfish and we're talking about full mangrove snapper, mm-hmm. like mangrove jacks. Lots of other, lots of other fish, so yeah, trevally. Do you guys have a lot of people who come in internationally to fish the area, or are you mostly fishing locals? Um, mostly fishing Australians, but there's, I guess there'll be people that are on holidays mm-hmm. more more than direct destination. Yeah, it's uh, there's a little bit of it, but yeah, not so much. And I've seen some photos, and it just looks beautiful with the mountains, like you were talking about. I was kind of looking through some stuff this morning when I found out we were going to sit down, and yeah, I gotcha. mean, it looks incredible. Like the fishery it looks beautiful. Yeah, um, I mean, a few guys that have, from Florida that have been there can't believe that there's a, a you know flats with a three and a half thousand foot mountain in the background. You mm-hmm. know, just right in the background too. You know, and um, I would think that being in Australia, you were mentioning that when you first got into fly fishing, that somebody kind of got you into it so they'd have one other person to fish with. Just not a huge cultural thing, at least when you're coming up. I would think there would be some big obstacles to trying to figure out the whole flats guiding, fly fishing oh, stuff there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, especially the, then, you know, whatever that was, like, um, you know, 30 years ago, I suppose. Well, maybe more. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, because we didn't, we hadn't even heard of a permit. <laughs> and then you you know running around. I guess initially you're fishing with that fly rod to catch the uh, the barramundi etc. that you were that you were spin fishing for. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, and then of course no internet, no whatever, no one else knew anything anyway, and you just might definitely making it up as you're going along. But yeah, I don't know. So, um, I guess you're learning. Uh, bouncing stuff off each other and and reading the odd US fly mag. That okay. Was, so you guys had access probably to that, yeah. the information. Yeah. Um, fly fishing in salt waters, was that one of them, I suppose? Yeah. Because okay. that's what I was wondering is that was a really innovative time down in the Keys and we got Harry sitting here at the table too <clears> where they were figuring out a lot of stuff but then they yeah. were at the bar or, you know, yeah, dinner well, together. Lots of lots of water and lots of guides i suppose where yeah we definitely didn't have that but that was i know at one stage there when i first really started to uh find out what a permit was and uh there's a few articles in there that were yeah pretty um Mm -hmm. crucial to work work starting to work out tiny bits of what you know how or when or where or whatever yeah could you talk me through how that's evolved over the years for you, but also for, I guess, Australia in general with fly fishing growing in popularity? Um, well, for me, I guess it's just uh, it's just been time on the water, you know, to catch those fish. Um, probably one of the things, you know, if you said what would you do looking back, well, I would have bought a, like a U.S. polling skiff mm-hmm. a lot longer than What were you using before? Oh, you don't want to know. Uh, it's not pretty. You got to tell me now. Just a well, we would say aluminium, but just an aluminium okay piece of shit, you know. <laughs> uh, so yeah, and that progressed to now you know, a couple of different polling skiffs. That yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you and remember was big, how'd you get your first polling skiff? Was, was it deal. built in Australia, or did you have to get it? No, no, it over? was from the US, and it was a bit of a fluke. I think I had looked at through the mags, you know, you. you spotted the hues because that was the era you know within the magazines and the ad all the big glossy ads Mm -hmm. and then uh a client from sydney a friend of his had just started importing a boat and they made a flats boat uh i don't know that i really want to name it because i won't say it was a great one so Mm -hmm. i had that for maybe three years three three and a bit maybe maybe nearly four years and then that was my first trip over to uh, go tarpon fishing, mm-hmm. which I hooked up with the boys here in the panhandle and fished through Jarrow Brewer. I, I uh, f- 
fish with Christian Jurgens, mm. and he had a 17 HPX and it was like some sort of revelation, you know. Mm. So that's so, what I've got. Well, I've got an 18 H. That's what I've been running now for the last 10 years. What other obstacles did you run into when you first started guiding over in Australia? Um, well, I don't know. Not really that many because there wasn't any, wasn't and really still isn't any guides. Mm -hmm. Like there's not even, there isn't even many local anglers where I'm at, mm. you know, there's not. Um, no, so it was just probably having to, make it all up as you went including flies mm -hmm. because you couldn't buy any of those either like so much has changed in the last even five years you know but definitely 20 years it was just like availability of information flies fly lines etc mm -hmm. has exploded in the last 10 you know to, you know like I said 20 but definitely the last 10 and five just keeps going and going um yeah, so just the lack, you know. Lack of information. Lack of information, for sure. Do you remember the first time coming over here and starting to fish and hang out with the Florida guides? Oh, yeah, I wasn't going what, home. What was that? Yeah, what was that like? Tell us about that. Um, well, our first, our first uh, we flew into Cuba and fished Cuba first because it was a tarp and myself and my mate Rolly. Um, we fished Cuba. Then we went to the Keys. We're only there about four days, I think. Um, but the weather was pretty nasty, so that was pretty limited. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, checking out the fly shops and the bars and whatever, um, you know, we're on holidays. And um, and then, then we came up and fished with Christian, like I said. So we contacted, uh, I think a client had Jero's email, so I contacted Jero. He was booked, fish, fish with Christian maybe for five days, if I had to guess. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, those boys treated us like lost cousins or something, mm. you know. So that was super special. It was like I said, I wasn't going home, but we did, obviously. Yeah. Um, and been back ever since. And maybe the first two or three years, I used to come over twice a year, fish with, with G with, and, uh, and the boys. And that was like, you know, go down the glades and fish there for a week and, Mm -hmm. come up into the panhandle and hang out here for two or three or something like that that's awesome Out, outside of the the skiff what were some other things that you when you first started coming to the states that you took back to you back with you to australia um well i don't know i think every time you travel somewhere and fish with someone different you just pick up mm -hmm. you know just pick up other ideas and other it was interesting to see the different flies i guess mm -hmm. kind of from what we fished in cuba or took to cuba because you didn't really those boys mm. didn't really have anything there um so I took to cuba and then came up to the panhandle and saw what those boys were using on flies so probably that easily techniques mm -hmm. um you know small things mm -hmm. you definitely pick up small things off a lot of and you know, and then I've been back, like I said, fishing with off uh, with G for X amount of years now. Yeah, and definitely learned a lot of small thing, you know, like yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. all the little details that add up. Yeah, diff just different, just subtle things, you know. But mm -hmm. it it adds up to the picture, you know, of um, G and Harry and yeah. Yeah, I guess that was probably the other thing out of the US. Maybe the fact he kind of didn't realise how big perhaps the culture was, I suppose. Okay. Maybe, yeah. Like how big the In fly the... fishing culture was? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You come over here and it's like there's big brands and stickers and bars that are Yeah, fly you know, you run and... into one shop to the next to the, mm -hmm. you know. So, which is definitely not the case at home. Like I said started off you couldn't oh, I, don't, I don't remember maybe you could buy a couple of flies but you didn't because i don't know where that came yeah. from but they went do you remember the first time you hooked up on a permit in australia uh yeah i think i broke it off um <laughs> but um 
Uh, probably, probably a couple of clients mm-hmm. caught one before I got to. Because generally, fishing, I'd be where I fish is fairly tidal, mm-hmm. so I don't get to fish. It's almost sort of two, two weeks out of the four in every month, sort mm-hmm. of thing. I guess you, it's not exactly how it rolls, but so. All my clients are on the best tides, mm-hmm. so I get to fish what's left, yeah. you know, and it's not sometimes not stuff that you'd even bother wanting to go f- for a fish. It's quite the variations, huge, like compared to if you guys get a three foot variation, we get three meters, mm. so nine feet something, whatever that adds up to, yeah. ten foot, ten foot, which is not something you go permit fishing in. Ten- Do you? Uh- when when the tide's not right, do you target other species or do you um, just kind of? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that even in a even in a day, perhaps like if you maybe fish our area for five, six, seven days, which is pretty typical of someone mm-hmm. coming up to fish. Um, even if the weather's glam, you're not really going to be permit fishing all day for those mm-hmm. seven days. Mm-hmm. You know, so the tide even in one given day maybe that it's you know probably worth permit fishing for three or four hours or whatever it might be you mm-hmm. know some some of them would be as long as the sun would allow mm-hmm. you know but um otherwise yeah yeah um i guess on on working on the tides barramundi a lot of the places where we're targeting permit you're going to find other stuff like queen mm-hmm. fish and giant trevally golden trevally as well what's what's your favorite at behind permit what's your favorite to go after with a with a client uh probably barramundi it's it's vastly different like chasing golden trevally is like permit fishing mm-hmm. except they you can catch them a bit easier mm-hmm. if you know, if you make a good cast and get the fly down you know often you know they're, they're not easy but they definitely a lot easier than mm-hmm. a permit on on average um queen fish are pretty spectacular because they're you know big runs and jumps there's probably i, I think i like barramundi because it's a bit like they react like a tarpon mm-hmm. like a atlantic tarpon it's just that they're small but mm-hmm. well in re, in relation, relation. Yeah, yeah 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 um and you have to be like we're fishing pretty skinny water for them so you've got to be pretty stealthy and Mm -hmm. so that i think that's that part of it Mm -hmm. it's not a high pressure situation but it's you know you make a make a good cast it's uh, everything else from there is slow until it until it's hooked and then it's just like fighting a baby tarpon yeah that sounds awesome i would love to hear if you just walk me through the perfect trip to Australia, like time of year, species to target, you know, just kind of paint the picture for what a great trip to Australia looks like. And it can include fun stuff too, with like sightseeing or, you know. Yeah, I, um, I don't know. I guess if I hadn't, I hadn't seen the place, probably a little bit biased. I don't rate cities much at all. So you could probably land in, land in, uh, Brisbane and spend some time around the beaches there, mm-hmm. you know, which is sightseeing and seeing a bit of the Aussie uh, beach scene because there's a there's two there's a Gold Coast and a Sunshine Coast north and south of Brisbane, really mm-hmm. close, like an hour away. Um, and then, a, you know, then you could uh, either fly up to Cairns or road trip it up to Cairns, mm-hmm. and from there, that's probably some of the best. Uh, we're right. We're really close to Cairns, just south, a couple of hours south in a car, or you can probably jump on an aeroplane and fly a couple of hours north, and be pretty close to being at Cape York, mm-hmm. and and there's some pretty cool fishing up there. Mm-hmm. Um, we do we do a mothership season up up at Cape York in the middle of the year, mm. so in the U.S. summer, sort of June July, we run a, run a mothership up there. But um, and that's that's pretty cool. That's super mm-hmm. remote. There's no. You might see another boat 
but you're probably not going to see anyone else fishing. Wow. Um, yeah, maybe a yachty parked in one of the small rivers or something like that. Mm. Um, so that's, you know, that's very different. Uh, it's not that different in a fishery, I suppose, but it's mm. a very different trip as far as remote and whatever. Mm. Um, otherwise, we had the back half of the year is to pick at Hinchinbrook after that, so August through to December. Mm. And well, it's a it's a place where it's not a what time of year is what species are there. Nothing mm. changes. They're there all year round. There's little micro seasons where you know August. There's maybe August September. There's more queen fish, mm-hmm. but not that many more. Mm. You, you know, um, maybe whatever December. There's a few less permit, but there's more golden trevally you know mm. so it's not a and it's just about like any fishing it's just about you know get there on the right tides and the right and fluke the weather mm-hmm. get some clam weather and which again that's the back half of the year so we're in because we live in the wettest that's the wettest part of australia mm-hmm. so february through till sometime in april is can be wet mm-hmm. and, and it could be real wet you know, so I don't, I don't even bother. Mm-hmm. Just play around, go fishing. It's good fishing if you live there, mm-hmm. but if you're going to fly from the states, you don't fly to Australia, uh, northern Australia in um, January, February, March. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, unless you're just planning on hanging out and drinking beer and what type know. of beer, or any type. <laughs> We're not fussy. What, what's the what's the main beer that I always see at like Outback and what am I thinking of? It's like they. Oh, uh, so what do we export and don't drink? Fosters. Fosters. Yeah. Is that it? No that, one. That's what I was going to ask. No one. No one drinks that. What do you? No, think? Have no, you ever I'm not even sure if you can buy it. Yeah. In Australia, is, I mean. Is it even? Is it even made in Australia? Bro. <laughs> it is. Okay. All right. Okay. We got to confirm. Oh, right. Go have you ever been to an outback? No. No. no okay. No. That would be an interesting experience. I, you'd probably hate it though. Oh. You, I don't know. I feel like you'd probably feel like it's a disingenuous. A bit, uh, yeah, yeah, probably. No, but not fussy on beer. Some people are fussy on beer, but yeah. as long as it's cold. When you're not fishing, what do you like to do? Oh, uh, muck around with bikes. Okay. Motorbikes. Motorbikes, okay. Yeah. I've always been a fan of US, so, so it's typical that I have a US skiff because I had mm. a couple of Chevys and I've got four Harleys, Harleys and various states of disrepair i suppose and <laughs> don't like anything that works real well yeah and so I, I bet you guys have some incredible areas to bite i mean oh yeah and and probably not our area wouldn't be one of those places to skite but yeah mm-hmm. there's some great there'd be some great places to to mm-hmm. tour yeah i've got to work my way towards retirement and do a bit more of that but um mm-hmm. yeah that outside of outside of fishing that's probably it mm-hmm. Ta- taking the kids for a fish or or t- mucking around with a motorbike mm-hmm. and going for a ride on one of those yeah so with over 30 years of guiding i would think that you would come up with a handful of really fun stories on the water do you have any that stand out that that you can share of any really great days or funny stories or uh oh there's plenty of great days mm-hmm. like the only bad days is when the is when the fish are not playing the game mm-hmm. or the weather's terrible, mm-hmm. you know. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know that. Oh, okay, there'd be a million stories, I suppose, but probably have to drink a few more beers first. We'll have to have that on the next podcast. Yeah, you? maybe. Yeah, but um, yeah, some of the, you know, some of the stuff up the Cape. It's so remote that there's no one there. Mm-hmm. You know, some of those days are pretty special just for that, mm-hmm. you know. In, in what ways do you do things differently when you're going to a really remote space to guide? Oh, well, you t- like you're you're not taking skiffs up there because you're towing. Mm-hmm. Or, I mean, obviously, you, we're fishing out of three boats, but you wouldn't call them technical polling skiffs. Mm-hmm. It's not that we're towing a long way, steaming a long way, but, you know, the water's not that great. Well, it can be mm-hmm. a bit sketchy or whatever and not well aside of that there's none 
mm. gonna have to get Harry to start building a few more of those. Like you yeah. can't buy a polling sieve in Australia. We don't make anything anything even remotely close. What what do people like to do in Australia? What what are we gonna buy a pontoon boat or a no, no, not that either. A um, lot, lot of alloy. Okay. Lot of aluminum. Okay. Yeah. Um, and a lot of, they like to think they're all rounders in a boat. We all know what that means. It's useless for everything. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a. The all rounder. Yeah. There's the no all such thing. <laughs> yeah. um, you just buy another, we just get two, you know? Like, yeah. It's good for retail. Well, if, if you're good, I'd love to hop into some rapid fire questions. And I thought it would be fun to plug Harry's mic in. Yeah, that'd be cool. <laughs> and let Harry Spear hop in here. So I'm going to take a moment to get that set. All right. So we got Harry on now. And uh, I thought it would be fun for you to tell the story about how you and Harry first met. Uh, it, would, it, was, it would be a trip over here with Jero. And I think we had been down to the Keys, perhaps. So early, maybe March or April, early April. And um, on the way back, we, he uh, he said, oh, we're going to drop in and have uh, have dinner at Harry Spear's place. And I thought, shit, he's like throwing that, you know, yeah. that'd be great, meet Harry Spear. And, uh, you know, because people in Oz have heard all the names that you read in the books Mm -hmm. but you know like you have to be kind of have you have to be right into it know to know who people like harry and Mm -hmm. steve and rick and etc you know on and on and on who those people are you know Mm -hmm. because it's probably not been in the glossy books that you know people write and talk about themselves and those things you know Mm -hmm. but yeah yeah so that was uh that was my first experience and the same like i said you know uh when I came over here the first time, just get treated like long lost cousins, and well, Americans love the accent. That's how it's been, and that's how yeah, it's true. <laughs> they love the accent, so yeah, that helped. It was probably pretty. It's probably pretty exciting to be in the Keys and have a guy coming in from Australia to learn about fishing. Yeah, especially if he says Fordane. <laughs> <laughs> and he and he tells you about how big the tarpon are over there. Uh, no, they don't say that. <laughs> that's not the exciting No, part. that's not that's not no, the way it no, is. No. I've been dying to get Dave to use some of the language. He's saying aluminium. They call them tinnies. True. It's True. also a beer, but yeah. Yeah, a True. tinny is a is an aluminum boat. Okay. They've got so many great words over there. I like all of them. G- give us a few good Australian words, because I we talked about. I had a, a listener reach out and say, "Hey, mate, great potty." And oh we were talking yeah, about how yeah, like potty yeah, yeah. for us is like a, a podcast. Is a, <laughs> yeah, yeah, a child's toilet. Yeah, give us, oh, yeah, give us a couple good things. ones. Well, we're talking about bogans today. Yeah, yeah. We're Aussie redneck is a bogan. Yeah, slightly down from a redneck. I, I imagine a bogan. A bogan. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, tinnies. A lot of people would call their little alloy boat a tinny. A tinny. But yeah. it's also a beer if it's in a can, I suppose. You know, <laughs> throw me, a, throw me a tinny. <laughs> Maybe fitting. <laughs> Maybe a fitting correlation between the two words there. Yeah, yeah. In some ways. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, there is a quote. You know, it's somewhere in Australia when you've got enough aluminium underneath the house to make a boat. Mm. So that's about how many beers you've drunk. You know. <laughs> Any um, other good terms, words, phrases? Uh, yeah, I guess there's so many of them that we don't... It just comes out. Like yeah. Harry probably has more because he's tucked them aside and thinks that's great. But yeah, every time you say, you know, I think I called someone... A, a squeezer once, and Harry's yeah, oh, yeah, what's I a like squeezer? A... Well, yeah, you know, I don't know. But um, yeah, I think there's a mil- I think there's a million of them, and yeah, it's it's great. Different cultures have different ways of expressing things, and it's usually fun to listen to it. And then, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, it's probably a little easier f- for us because there's been so much uh, US TV you know mm-hmm. through yeah. like, through Oz in the last however many years that mm-hmm. you've heard all the expressions but yeah I think every time uh, but that aluminium throws mm-hmm. I think uh, we were at Bo Meadows place once and I told him that most of our boats are made out of aluminium and he's just given me the strangest look <laughs> it's a special metal yeah yeah, 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 yeah. It's just it's only found special. in Australia in beer yeah. cans yeah <laughs> 
Um, you know, one of the things I was curious about was if you had any favorite Australian cuisines or any Australian uh, cooking recipes. I've been oh, trying to gather some good okay. recipes. Well, I guess my f- favorite Australian cuisine is a pie, which you, d- you guys don't have. Okay. Well, well, ta- well, can you talk us through well, it so we a can meat, tr- attempt? a meat pie. Okay. So it's just a small version of uh, what you guys would, what do you put in, like apple and yeah, yeah. pumpkin and whatever? Mm. No, well, I also got meat. It's probably, you know, kangaroo or something, but... Um, dingo. But dingo. But it's been a, uh, yeah, you know, I think when I was a kid, I did an apprenticeship working on the tools working on cars and bikes and boats, etc. And um, I think I at least ate one of those per day for, God, no, maybe two, you know. Like, have you had a chicken pot pie? Would it be like that? My mom used to make a lot of chicken pot pies. It would have like stuffed chicken, carrots, oh, peas. Candles, peas. Yeah, yeah. well, there, there'll be, you know, it would have started off as this meat thing, but it's definitely progressed. But it's yeah. just a small, you know, holding your hand, eat that. Round come, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning, breaking for what we call smoko. Actually, what do you call smoko? Dude, there's a smoke. A smoko is when you go to smoke, right? Yeah, but yeah, but yeah, right, yeah. So but no that's just a break? Anymore, but yeah, 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 yeah. So it'd be a standard sort of break, 10 o'clock ish, I suppose, in the morning. Smoko, pies. <laughs> um, but as far as recipes go, yeah, oh, you've struck the wrong person. I can sort of. I'm okay on toast. When you first met Harry, did Harry cook for you? Can you? Yeah, yeah. Cook? Harry's Harry's a great cook. Well, yeah. You want to give us a good recipe real quick? A good I recipe. I didn't ask you that. Yeah. What what cut? What do you want it on? Do you want it for meat or for fish or? Uh, do you have any good uh, smoker recipes? Smoko recipes? No smoker recipes like barbecue. No, I'm not, or... I'm not a really well, a give, barbecue. Give us a give us a good fish recipe. All uh, right. Um. I guess one of most people's favorite that I do is a, a baked fish recipe where I'll take a glass dish, put about an eighth of an inch of olive oil in it, pat the fish dry, pat the fillet dry, usually like a, a good size fillet, maybe an inch thick, inch mm-hmm. and a quarter, and uh, put salt and pepper and garlic on it and lime, and then I'll put like, take um, saltine crackers beat them in a plastic bag till they're just like flakes and put that all over the top and then put fresh grated Parmesan cheese on top of that Mm. and bake it for till you dip a fork through the thickest part 15 minutes 20 minutes Mm -hmm. depending on the size of the filet that's pretty awesome that sounds good to me yeah that's I've had that yeah I think that might have been what we had that crispiness that you get you would you know you can't go wrong with garlic and Mm-mm. and lemon or lime mm-hmm. on a piece of fish with salt and pepper. It's going to be good, good flavor. And then that the crackers and the uh, the Parmesan cheese makes a little bit of a crust, mm-hmm. and that's just on the top, so it's never really down in anything liquid, so it just gets kind of mm. crunchy. Oh, sweet. That sounds good. I think I might try that soon. Mm-hmm. That's a good one. It is good. I got another fun kind of fishing-related question Outside of getting your polling skiff, what was the biggest game changer for you in having success with chasing fish? Outside of that. Um, 20 foot long and it fits in your hands. So yeah, push pole. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that is so, like the push pole, the boat obviously, but and, and polling it is definitely, um, is definitely one of the biggest, biggest uh, changes. Not that we, we were kind of doing that with, shitty boats before that too but not nowhere near to what did you have extent. for push poles when you started out yeah yeah did have a push poles did, I don't know where, did how glass that ones or about. yeah glass carbon ones. glass ones or just you know something that would do the job yeah but they were glass yeah, yeah, yeah. those those original ones we had were moonlighter was a company and they were red and if you wanted to go fast and, and then of course our boats were much heavier than mm-hmm. the boats I built so you'd lean on that thing and it would just bend in this big freaking curve and you'd just hang on. You'd be torqued all the way down and hang on and the boat would just finally go. That's why they call it moonlighter. It's like a little shaped like a little moon when you're pulling it. I don't know. They were, and they were heavy. They were horrible. Our boats were horrible. Our push poles were horrible. 
I when think, I had Larry Hastings on, he was talking about how when they were trying to chase those bonefish down uh-huh. there, and the he said that they would get like shower curtain rods, which <laughs> and push those around. Yeah, so that's well, a, Marty that's a experienced my first push bowl. I was on my first pole and skiff, and it was the same a glass one, uh-huh. and same thing, and we had the big bend in it, uh-huh. and then there was this cracking noise. Uh oh, yeah, it broke in half. Which, and you went the, out of the boat, yeah, of course. I was in full. Full tilt backward. Yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Straight well, in. Whenever Josh upgraded from the piece of bamboo to the plastic <laughs> stiffy, it had a little bit of a crack in it. So you would push, use the push pull, and then you would like turn it, and it would have, you'd feel water kind of flowing oh, down. Yeah. It was kind of like a rain stick. Ah, oh, yeah. And he's upgraded now. So um, I would love to hear too about, uh, so we were talking earlier about tattoos. Could you tell us a little bit about what tattoos you have and what meaningful ones may be there, uh, or your favorites? Well, I guess the like this tarpon, obviously with that tarpon addiction after coming yeah. over. And over I'll, throw, I'll throw a few photos in the blog really post. Not really coming back. And then, um, you know, the permit, well, I suppose. That's super cool, yeah. I had to have a permit tattoo. Uh, like I've had, uh, there's, I've got other tattoos at the top of my arms that have been there for 30 years, I suppose. So that was, that were just to make motorbikes go faster, really. <laughs> and then um got this like piratey stuff from my one of a good friend of mine he used to call me uh jack after that crazy pirates of the caribbean thing because he said oh, yeah, i yeah. watched it too much so <laughs> he passed away from cancer so that's actually jack sparrows okay uh johnny depp's tattoo that he has johnny depp has that tattoo that's yeah, in yeah. the movie they just yeah, left yeah. it Going, oh well it's almost whatever because it's not a sparrow it's a swallow yeah <laughs> so close enough and then i thought it kind of looked lonely so i got all this other pirate shit as well yeah so. yeah it looks cool yeah and then you got a ship over here i have a ship on my arm yeah ship that's fairly new that ship um and then i have you know i've got a uh sailor jerry that the rum oh, but he's some old, good rum he's an old tattooist yeah did so you that's, that's yeah sailor jerry i've, I've couple, followed oh, some of his sailor stuff jerry tattoos, yeah. that's cool um so just because it's original old school stuff you know yeah yeah that's me. cool I, yeah. I like that traditional style when did you first start getting tattoos was it when you first started guiding no no oh, okay no. Like, i was I gonna say that was like 21 or two or something okay because because yeah. i mean that's pretty popular now in mm-hmm. the guiding fishing i see a lot of but you might have been a trendsetter on that which is oh you might have been a little early on it oh earlier on the tattoos when i the city uh, cans i'd say close to the city i suppose um there was one tattoo shop and two tattooers mm-hmm. and now there's probably you know six or seven shops and what, what's your favorite out of all the ones you have uh maybe the maybe the sailor jerry i think um, the girl who did it just did a great job on the old school colours mm-hmm. and whatever. But this, like, it's an old, that's an old, old mm-hmm. greywash thing. But that's Ned Kelly, our most famous outlaw, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Like you guys said, you know, whoever you had, Billy the Kid or mm-hmm. whatever. But yeah. yeah, so we had Ned Kelly, crazy Irishman that put some tin helmet on and went and fought the cops. You know? Nice. <laughs> so, that's just called an Irishman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm well, Irish, don't have to, don't have to put the crazy bit in front, you reckon? Um, yeah, I don't know, but that's always been me. I remember skipping school with another mate, and all we did was draw tattoos on each other's arms or something like that. Mm. Hiding, you know, it's just something I don't know. Like, with what a, did you draw them with? Like magic markers? Oh man, that's too long ago. <laughs> Sharp twelve or thirteen? I don't remember. At least you didn't do the you know actually say i think oh, we could get no. a pen and i could do this i think i could do this because yeah. i've met guys that like when they were in their teens seemed you like know. a good idea at the time yeah yeah you got any rapid fire questions i'm curious what questions you would throw in the hat and for davo yeah yeah um i was i wanted to make a kind of a comment you know when dave was talking about coming over here and learning techniques and stuff that was i think what we actually gave saltwater fly fishing in the from the keys there were so many of us doing doing it and everybody mm. was trying to figure out cool stuff and it just helped the whole sport evolve oh yeah yeah no doubt yeah no doubt um you know the question before about what what else and it would still come back to 
our only source of information being what you guys were doing. Mm -hmm. That would that's the only other thing. And you know, when I was a kid, it was the same thing, because there was uh, salt. There's field and stream. I don't even know whether saltwater sportsman was out yet. Outdoor life and field and stream, I think, were the two original outdoor magazines. And you'd look in there and you'd flip to some article and you go, holy crap, look at this. Mm -hmm. You know, and it was how we got inspired. Mm -hmm. You know, we had Joe Brooks and, and, uh, and some of those guys, those original guys that, did all that stuff and wrote about it and yeah it was pretty amazing and then so you were reading those magazines or some some of the later guys after that and mm -hmm. you'd see those articles and you'd go wow I can do that <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah I want to oh I wanted to talk to you about all the cool game animals you can shoot over in Australia and you don't even need a license is that true oh well, you need a gun license but what if you're no. bow hunting no, 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 no. You can just go over and shoot stuff. Yeah. I mean, the, probably the biggest uh, hurdle that you would come across would just be getting a, uh, access to somebody's land to do that on. Mm -hmm. If you weren't, you know, like a park. Well, if, if I was with a guy named Dave Bradley, I probably wouldn't have any but hurdles. It, yeah, I mean, if you're approaching people like that and you're bow hunting, well, it's not, you know, it's not such a big, it's not such a big issue. Rifles yeah, well, are a bit different. They make a bit of noise and yeah, scare yeah. people. And well, yeah. Marty was saying about what, where, where's the place where the deer are a nuisance and there's seven species. New South Wales. New South Wales. You can shoot as many as you want. Now I like that kind of a spot. <laughs> Y'all eat them? We eat them like yeah. crazy over here. Yeah, yeah. they're great. Yeah, they do too. Oh yeah, the this guys awesome. that hunt them. Yeah, eat them. Yeah. Yeah, I think um probably at the wrong end of the country for that really like our hunting would be feral pigs mm -hmm. is it better south where it's mm -hmm. cool oh yeah yeah they're not we mm -hmm. don't even deer don't even live up where we are mm. it's, it's too hot i guess I, I really don't know i don't mm -hmm. i don't know much about them because i've never lived anywhere else mm. um but yeah yeah i mean there's a lot that's right you you know a trip to oz you can definitely combine more than you can do some, just, some more sport yeah Instead of just whacking fish, you can, yeah, you can go bow hunting. I know when I was a younger man and single, you'd see these articles about Sydney and stuff like that. And one thing I noticed is Australia has some really beautiful women. Yeah, we. If you go to Sydney, just go to the beach, skip the rest. <laughs> um, yeah, you I'm didn't not, put that on your uh, travel guide. Yeah, well, I was know, wondering why you didn't guide. say well, I, that. I did know? say that you could go to the beaches to in the Brisbane. Beaches. Yeah, just, you were just being a little more. Yeah, so well, he's been married about, forever yeah. too. Yeah, you know, so he's probably forgotten about pretty girls. <laughs> I, I have a question to be fun to for you to answer with Harry here, but um, so obviously you're coming over the states and it, it's real big. A lot of the flats fishing, the fly fishing is it's really big down here. It's coming from out of out of the states and Florida. Um, what is something that you feel like you guys do better in Australia as a whole than we do here in the Southeast of the United States? Uh, yeah, I don't, I know the answer. You know the answer? Drink beer. You guys drink yeah. beer better than us? Well, how do we quantify I don't know, that? I don't know if we have a <laughs> contest, I'm okay at it. I'm okay. I don't think I'm leading the country in the sport. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know that we do anything better. We definitely don't have the flats at, like like uh, this part of the world does. Mm -hmm. um, be it like that massive marsh over there, or Florida Bay, mm -hmm. or I oh know I guess Fleming. Uh, you know the mangrove side of uh, Everglades really isn't flats, but you know, something like the Keys or whatever. And we also have like those tidal variations I was mm -hmm. talking about. So that's, yeah, it's very, it's very different. And basically down in the south, apart from some, this is the south of Australia, southern part of Australia, um, those guys would have even less. 
mm-hmm. apart from maybe some uh, salt water lake, like a, I suppose it's an estuary lake, you know, mm-hmm. uh, something like that, like Whitewater Bay, mm-hmm. for instance, but it's not like that. I don't know what I even said that. But, um, and then there's nothing there anyway, nothing that would excite. There's a good fishery if you like. Are y'all there, more laid you know? back? I, I was because I was wondering that. Like I feel I'd like, like I've, to think so. I've I've met people, you know, people who live in other countries that say that they feel like Americans aren't very good at just kind of relaxing and going with it and that could be definitely an issue with clients or I, I didn't know if you've experienced some of that. Uh I I think we probably are, but that's again North Queensland, like mm-hmm. the northern part of the country. Because nobody lives there either. That's the next part. But a lot of people will fish because mm-hmm. there's nothing else to do. Tell us about the the bay to the south of you, where the the black marlin and the longfin tuna come in. Tell us about that fishery. Oh yeah, that's I guess it's commonly known as Harvey Bay in Australia, but there is actually no town called it's uh that is the bay, and there's a big sand island. Um, Fraser Island. How far is that it's off just, the mainland? Just, well, it basically touches it. Okay. You know, again, there's another estuary system that rolls down the inside of it. But um, so that's I don't know. Let's call it three hours drive north of Brisbane. Mm-hmm. And um, so that this big sand island is almost the start of what, what a species calls tropical species or the end of tropical species and the side of subtropical species like you some one side of it you'll hardly catch anything of what that when then the opposite side you know mm-hmm. so it's almost like it's drawing a rough line but it, it's almost the case um yeah and of course there's exemptions so that fishery because it sits at the very bottom of what you would call tropical uh there's a lot of different fish there i suppose year round but those that sort of thing happens closer to our summer mm-hmm. and it's just part of the migration of if you're talking about a black marlin it's mm-hmm. part of migration of them heading south mm-hmm. so it's not whilst it's possible it's not anything like a tarpon migration yeah, and billfish are different. One year there's lots of them because they they're spawned up in cans, mm-hmm. so they swim. That's probably a thousand mile swim, mm-hmm. and by the time they hit there, you know, some of them could be only twelve pounds. Some of them could be thirty pounds. Mm-hmm. You know, depending on when where they hit the whatever. Anyway, um. I'm really, there's lots of people that are way more experienced in this sort of chat than me. But so, and then some of them will, because this thing sticks such a long way out into the ocean, some of them will hit that and just chill out there for a while, I suppose. Um, there's a mate of mine that probably kicked most of it off and he still, he still, he still wouldn't say he was the first person to do it. And But uh, yeah, he found those fish coming down the beach when he was looking for tuna coming down this beach the long fins yeah we call them long tails but long tails or northern long blues tail. or whatever but you know everything's got different names but um so those fish uh he was looking for those they're, they're they're not close to the beach you wouldn't catch one off the beach all the photos you've seen someone holding it on the beach they just dragged it to the beach mm-hmm. how deep a water do they swim in if you're seeing them sight fishing them minimum of about maybe six or eight mm-hmm. it's not you know it's a bit like the tarps but not as skinny mm-hmm. not, it's probably they're probably out in 10 or 12 foot of water mm-hmm. realistically uh so here yeah, he found these things swimming down the beach when he was looking for tuna and just couldn't hook one because they're just trying to chuck a fly at it and strip it mm-hmm. you know and billfish are attacking the fly and mm-hmm. i gave him a few loose pointers there i suppose because he he didn't he hadn't really marlin fish too much but yeah that's that's harvey bay so that's not whilst it's great and if you saw it it's pretty amazing but don't be disappointed if you didn't see it yeah i know i mean it's just because it's not it's a, a fantastic thought to be able to pull a boat and see marlin and tuna 
swimming towards you. Yeah, I saw yeah. one time a video, I guess it was on YouTube, of a guy in a skiff, maybe an HPX, I don't know. It was, it was a nice looking boat. And uh, the guy was on the bow and he said something about, um, here comes some tuna. And you see the guy cast, and then you see these bullets, black bullets coming through the water, and whang, he hooks it up, and it's just screaming off. And then the other guy says, Black Marlin! And then he casts his fly out, and he hits a black marlin. They've got a tuna and a black marlin on at the same time, and I just thought, holy crap, that's cool. No, that's sounds incredible. Yeah, 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 that's pretty, and pretty rare. Yeah, I'm sure it's super rare, but wow. it's still, the thought of it is pretty cool. Yeah, 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 you know? it is, yeah. Um, but you know, you guys have got some, we've got some, some unusual stories. All right, that's a good question. Most unusual things you've seen out on the water. Most unusual. I don't, know, I don't think it'd be fish related. Um, if it were we're talking most unusual, that makes it really interesting. Uh, you know, <laughs> like, a, you know, maybe something crocodiles eating a turtle or yeah. Yeah. Big salties. Tell us like about that. that. That's the one that lives near Hinchinbrook. The oh, named one. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They would. Uh, the locals think that they have this friendly crocodile that went up and down the beach there. I'm sure he's really friendly. Yeah, yeah, really friendly. Yeah, yeah. You go down and pat on it, pat it if you want to lose an arm. Um, and reportedly, someone shot it. So. There you go. It's not there anymore. But let's t tell us about how big, it, what his name was, and how big he was. Um, I think they called it Bismarck because remember what was there was a ship. Was that a was it a U.S. warship? What's the one up north? Jacko or? Oh, oh righty, yeah. gotcha. Yeah, well, that's it. I'm talking at Hinchinbrook, but yeah, in those northern rivers, there's crocodiles. There's crocodiles everywhere, man. But tell us about that one, how big it was, the size of it. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I've seen those things probably up to, people get a bit carried about, about how long they are. Mm -hmm. I think I've probably seen them up to about 16 feet and just turned, the, I was in a small boat and I just turned the boat around. How, how big, how big are, wide are they? Because I don't know what it would weigh. I have no idea what it would weigh, but it'd be... I'd say it'd have to be, you know, seven foot in girth, I reckon, by the time you put a tape oh around gosh. it. At 16 or 18 foot long, yeah. Yeah. They're huge. Certainly not going to give him a cuddle. <laughs> so that'd be more than a 1,000 pounds for sure. It'd have to be, wouldn't it? Hmm. Yeah. That long and that fat. That's a beast, and, isn't it? Yeah. And then people go, oh, you know, and if you're caught out, you have to run. You make sure you run. Like it's got... Its legs are about a, a foot long. It can barely get its ass off the ground. You could just walk away from it. <laughs> anyway, people get it's it's one of those things. Aussies are, they think they know everything about crocodiles. Two things: crocodiles and barramundi. Most people know jack shit about either. Of them. <laughs> Crocodile and knew about all yeah. that stuff. Oh, of course he did. Yeah, of course he did. So, if you could go back thirty years ago, right when you first started you were invited into fly fishing you were about to start guiding what advice would you give yourself uh go tarpon fishing and buy a skiff because <laughs> about the same time that i wanted a skiff i probably couldn't afford one but i was mm -hmm. spending money on it you know um and i don't know why it took me so long to go tarpon mm -hmm. fishing either because that would be around the same era that i would have started reading those fly fishing in salt water or whatever it was at that time um you know you saw a bloke standing on the front of a skiff catching the tarp and you go god i've got to go and do that mm. and then wait for how long to do it well that was stupid mm. so yeah that'd be the two things go uh, go to the u.s go tarp fishing and buy a skiff while you're there well one of the great things dave has done is he's brought a lot of his friends over to the u.s mm. to go fishing and they've got to experience uh, yeah, yeah, most of them wouldn't have. It wouldn't have. Been, they wouldn't have done it if you had been something. They think, oh, we'll go and do that, but mm -hmm. they, but you know, they probably still wouldn't have, mm -hmm. or maybe wouldn't have. But now they'll definitely be, you know, back, and they've all met 
guys like yourself and and Jero and mm-hmm. and everyone just likes the 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 culture too down in the south, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's beer. Well, if uh, people the, want to come over and fish with you and experience Australia, what's the best way for them to reach out? Oh, I guess uh, the easiest things to find are probably uh, Facebook and Instagram. Mm-hmm. You know, I can't remember the last time I even looked at my own website. I don't know if it works. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> well, what, what's your it's uh, kind I'll, of old I'll, thing? I'll, well, include, my company's, I'll include the links too. Yeah, there. sure. My company is called Australian Fly Fishing Outfitters, and I kind of changed it to that a few years ago, or 12, 10 or 12 years ago, probably, just to try and. Um, oh, I had one mate guiding with me that was a bit. He was a bit of a. No, he was a bit nomadic, you know. It was mm-hmm. probably trying to tie him down to do something together. Mm-hmm. That didn't work. <laughs> but um, but yeah, it's kind of it's it's stuck. Um, and yeah, I got a. So you know, there's a group of mates listed on that website, I suppose, that guide in different destinations mm-hmm. like Harvey Bay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Sydney Harbour's got a good, cool little fishery too, you know, like you're in Sydney, you've got one day to go to the beach and look at the girls and another day to jump in a boat. Mm-hmm. Go catch something. Bounce around. Yeah, it's kind of pelagic, smaller pelagic mm-hmm. fish. Mm-hmm. It's There's a lot of fish in there for a city fishery. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, so that's that's the business name anyway, long story short, Australian Fly Fishing. You outfits. know what I found really interesting that Dave told me a long time ago? And I just thought, I couldn't imagine this in the United States. Oh, yeah. I think I know all the fishing guides in Australia. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you're talking about saltwater fly, there's yeah. probably... Yeah. And they all yeah. talk to each other. There's probably seven of us, you know. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> be more in one street in all of them, right, wouldn't it? You imagine well, that? No. Seven fishing guides in the United States. Uh, yeah. Oh, no. man. Wouldn't I love to be a fishing guide in the United States? Yeah. Well, th- there's Where's your closest competition? Oh, let's see. Savannah. I think he's over there in, uh, yeah, either on uh, Brownsville, Texas, or <laughs> Savannah, Georgia. Yeah. Well, good. Well, thank you so much for hanging out with us. I hope you guys have a great party over here coming yeah, up on cool. Harry's 70th. And uh, thank you for giving us some time today. Yeah, appreciate it. Man. It's been fun. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thanks again for listening to the Captain's Collective podcast. To listen to more episodes and to learn about our sponsors, head to captainscollective.com. Till next time, this is the Captain's Collective.